Hello everybody and welcome back to Bigger on the Inside, the new Who, Doctor Who, Watch Long podcast. Just me this week. I've been talking to the really talented and lovely Daniel Evans, who some of you will best know as his role as Daniel Llewellyn in Doctor Who, The Christmas Invasion, the first episode to star the 10th Doctor, David Tennant. I chatted with Daniel about his time on Doctor Who and about the theatre industry and how it's coping at the moment given the current COVID-19 situation. Make sure you listen to the end for some news on some upcoming productions that Daniel's involved in, and how to contact the show. I'm the Doctor. I'm a Time Lord. I'm from the planet Gallifrey in the constellation of Casterberus. I hope the ears are a bit less conspicuous this time. You might be a Doctor, but I am... I'm a Doctor. There's probably not the one who expect. Absolutely fantastic. All of time and space, everything that ever happened or ever will, where do you want to start? So thank you for coming on, Daniel. I really, really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Good to talk to you. I was just wondering, because at the moment this will go out towards Christmas time, at the moment it's September, it's October at the moment, and Covid's still sort of lingering in the air here in the UK, how has that sort of affected the current world of theatre? Well, it's been it's been pretty bad. It's decimated theatre. Um, it's it's had a really really profound effect because, of course, one of the things the theatre relies on is a lot of people getting together in the same room, watching another group of people telling stories. So um, theatres, and in fact, theatres closed down before the government demanded that we close down, as in so many walks of life. I think the the, the public are leading the way here. Um, but having said all of that. Seven months after we did our last performance here at Chichester Festival Theatre, where I'm the artistic director, we have last week, um, in the middle of uh, October, announced our autumn season. And at the end of October, we are going to be doing our first play on the main stage, which is a play by Sarah Kane called Crave. Of oh, course. Cool. So has, has it been easy to sort of, I imagine, to encourage people to come back and work at the theatre? I imagine people are quite eager to come back. Uh, very eager to come back. We did an outdoor event at the end of the August bank holiday and then some indoor test events. And we, we gave audiences surveys and 95% of them filled those surveys in. And 99% of those people said with the precautions that we've got in place, hand sanitizing, temperature checking, ticket scanners, you know, etc., they'd be really happy to come back. Yeah, I feel people are definitely... I think even people who wouldn't necessarily go to the theatre or go see performing arts are really keen to go and basically see anything at the moment. I think that's right. I think people, you know, have recognised that the live performance aspect gives something unique. And however good the digital recordings are, it's not the same as watching a band live or watching a play live. You know, so it's not the same as being with other people experiencing something. I know I was just going to say, we just have to reassure people that we can do that safely, which we, we know we can here. We socially distance the audience and all of the precautions that I, um, you know, that I talked about. The hard thing for us is what happens when you do a play that requires intimacy. Yes. Yeah, because I, was it, I saw Coronation Street or somewhere like that where someone had to push someone out of a road and the behind the scenes footage of this big mannequin and the wigs falling off it and it did I can't imagine that getting away on stage very easily. No, and there have been instances where, you know, that's why um there's been quite a uh a, a, what can I say, a, a desire on the part of theatre to cast actors who are already in couples. Uh, okay, that's quite that's yeah, that's a good way around it, yeah. Well, you know, we're a creative bunch. So actually we're all, yeah, exactly. They're, they're, we're finding ways around it. Yeah. So you started off as an actor and then now a director. Do you think it helps to be an actor before becoming a director? Well, I, I suppose I would say this, but yes. I think it's quite good to know what the actor goes through when the actor is preparing a character and preparing, preparing a performance. I think it's... It, I. I I empathise, you know, with the actor as they're as they're going through the process, and um, and also I'm really fascinated by acting and actors, and I still act myself from time to time, and I think that's also important to sort of remind myself of what it is that you go through. 
they say that the stress that the actor goes through on on a press night, you know, opening night, is sort of akin to the stress that the body goes through in a minor car accident. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, when you when you were wearing, like, I'm just I'm just thinking of all these actors now, just nervous wrecks on the side of the side of the stage. And exactly, <laughs> where they are. A lot of them are. Yeah. Um, when you were an actor, was it two Olivia Awards you won for best actor? Yeah. Best actor in a musical. Yeah, that must open a lot of doors then, because I know because as a film student, you hear <laughs> once you win an Oscar, you sort of all these other paths open up, and to many people, the Olivia is a sort of the musical version of the Oscars. So does that open a lot of doors then for where you go forward? You know, it's really weird because I know many an Olivier Award winner who, you know, doesn't work as often as they should. I know, you know, many Olivier Award winner who's, you know, especially in the, during the last nine months, who's you know, now on the bread line. So I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's necessarily the equivalent of winning the Oscars because of course it's not, a, it's not, it doesn't get that kind of publicity or it doesn't get that kind of um, coverage. But in my experience, it was definitely a help. Particularly, for example, one of the shows that I won for was a show that started in a very small theatre in London, The Chocolate Factory. It then transferred to the West End and it then transferred to Broadway. And I think, you know, having an Olivier Award helped persuade the American producers that I should go with the show rather than be recast with an American actor. Is there a big difference in the way American theatre works compared to over here in England? Well, one of the big differences with something like Broadway is it's much more expensive. It's just much more expensive to make things. Um, that's partly because they, they have a totally different pay structure to you know people who work backstage. And some of that is really positive, And of course, some of it is um, restricting. Uh, but I think, yeah, I think on the whole, what's interesting at the moment is that the new writing, new plays in America are really exciting in that they're really unconventional. They're really playing with what theatre can be. They're really playing about with that idea. So they're quite surprising and innovative and um, lots of digital innovations as well as, as, well as storytelling innovations. So um and, and of course, what's interesting as well is the crossover now between theatre and TV writing. Yeah. Does it help? What came? It was theatre that came first for you, wasn't it? And then TV. Is there a stark yes. difference between working on stage then going on screen? Are some of the skills, I imagine a lot of the skills are transferable, but some of them as well, maybe over-exaggeration, I'm thinking, so that people in the audience can see stuff compared to people on a small screen. Definitely. Um, exactly. The, the kind of energy required is totally different, I would say. So whereas, you know, you're communicating with, say, a thousand people in the theatre and you've got to you know, project and learn how to look after your voice and do all of that. Well, it's the sort of opposite to on screen where stillness is the main is the most important thing and that the camera is, you know, can be so close that it can read your thoughts and and often the best directors on that I've worked with on TV say, actually just think, and the camera picks up that thought, um, so you don't have to do much. Yeah, because I know when we've done short films here at university, sometimes you get people in who have worked on, who are part of the drama society who have only ever done stage stuff, and you're like, I just need you to look sad. This person's died, and it's blubbering <laughs> eyes and everything. I'm like, whoa, whoa just take it back a bit. <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Whereas, of course, you do nothing on stage. Well, actually, stillness is important on stage as well, I should say. But um, it's got to read. It's got to read into the room. And so that sort of, um, that diff- as I said, different level of energy. Yeah. Directing on, so you directed stage shows. Would you be interested in then turning up and directing something for screen as well? I, do you know what? I'd love to. And just over the last couple of years, that's something that I've really been interested in. And, and actually, because um, I've been you know, involved in making trailers for shows, um, digital trailers for shows. And so they're, in a way, they're kind of mini, mini films in themselves, sort of three minute films. And I really love that process. And actually, one of the things that I am working on has a, um, has a digital aspect to it that's going to involve a more, uh, what can I say? I don't, I can't, I can't tell you what it is, unfortunately, but it's got, it's got two, it's got three parts to it. And two of those parts are happening digitally. 
So I think over the next year, I am going to get that experience, which I'm really excited about. All right, cool. So for a lot of people listening to this, I imagine they've tuned in because, like me, they are big Doctor Who fans. And a lot of people will know that um, you starred in The Christmas Invasion um, as Daniel Llewellyn. First question, was he always called Daniel Llewellyn or did Daniel come from you? <laughs> no, he was called Daniel Llewellyn when I picked up the script. But I should say that I, um, I was offered, I didn't have to audition, which was amazing. Uh, I knew Russell T. Davis because when I was 12, I did a programme called Why Don't You? And Russell T. Davis, yeah. It was basically a sort of program that that, uh, told kids what to do with themselves in the summer holidays. And Russell T. Davis was our script uh, writer and coach um, when I was 12 in Cardiff. And um, so I knew Russell a bit. And um, so I I just got offered the part and it was just curious. He's called Daniel. Um, And of course, I said yes straight away because it was, was great to be part, actually, of David Tennant's first episode. Yeah. Did you know that when you were signing up that it was going to be his first episode? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. I just don't know because I know sometimes they keep stuff secret, so you do, sometimes you don't know. Because sometimes you hear stories going, I didn't even know I was acting against actor A, I thought I was acting against actor B, but until I watched the show, they've edited it. And... No, they were very, very secretive with the scripts, but I just, I, I knew, my agent knew, and so, um, yeah, I was able to, um, I, and I think, I think Doctor Who at that point was quite, Quite big, wasn't it? So yeah, it, it was. was yeah. It was sort of the Christopher Eccleston that made such a big splash, and we knew that. I think it had already been announced that it was going to be David. Yeah. So, um, so I knew. I mean, I I didn't know much else in the plot because they only give you your scenes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So you knew up to being killed off, really, and that was it. <laughs> I knew that I was going to be electronically whipped to death by an alien. <laughs> Is it slightly disappointing to be killed off? Because I imagine it's one of those things where you're like, oh, I'd really like to do the full episode and a chance to come back. But at the same time, being killed in Doctor Who is also, I imagine, quite cool as well. Well, the thing about being killed in Doctor Who is, because Doctor Who, anything can happen. That's true. So if in a future episode they wanted to time travel and go back to, you know, the early years of Daniel Llewellyn, that would be really nice. Yeah. You've heard it here, BBC. That's what we want. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a lot of your scenes either take place in the like the unit building with Harriet Jones and all these soldiers, but there's also quite a nice scene on the alien spaceship where your character steps himself forward to sort of be like the face of the human race. Yeah, what's it like working in like? Because from the outside, that set looks pretty huge, but I imagine is a lot of it green screen. Some of it was green screen. But actually, a lot of it was actually set up. And weirdly, that, lots of that, was, that section was filmed in the bowels of the Wales Millennium Centre. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, no, not the Wales Millennium Centre. No, no, the, the Millennium Stadium. OK, yeah. So, so the rugby, you know, the, the rugby stadium in Cardiff. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they, because I suppose there's this massive underground car park and, you know, um, area... They transformed it and they they built this this whole set. So it was it was a bizarre shoot because we that was filmed in the Millennium Stadium. The where I was killed was filmed in literally in a cave in southeast Wales, in an actual <laughs> freezing cold cave. Some of it I remember was filmed on the roof of uh, the Tower of London. Yeah. Is that, is that the actual Tower of London then that you end That's up That's the on? actual Tower of London. <laughs> I don't imagine a lot of people get to go up there that often. We couldn't believe it. It was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it was really amazing. Is it surprising to still be talking about it 15 years later? Well, it's so weird because every now and then I get like, you know, letters through the post with, um, you know, Trump cards. Yeah. I was, I was about to say, I swear I had a Daniel Llewellyn top Trump's a trading card at some point in my childhood. <laughs> yeah, I've signed many, many a Trump card. Um, it's funny, isn't it? Just, just you know, I suppose partly because it was such a great episode as well, and it was David's first episode, and um, I think people remember it. You know, it was it was great fun. It was a fun episode as well as being very dramatic. So, um, yeah, it is funny to be talking about it. Yeah, it's a long time ago. Yeah, it always comes across that, especially with that show. Is that the it looks as much fun to make as it is to watch. It really is. 
and it, if if not, not more fun to make because it was just um, yeah it was it was the whole team was fantastic the producing team really looked after you um, it, it was it was and I think because it's filmed mostly you know by BBC Wales in South Wales and um, they were really proud of it right rightly so and um, and they, so they they were there was a real sense of pride and care that went into making it. Yeah, because I think Doctor Who was the first show to really move to Wales, and since then, is it casual to see quite a lot of these other BBC dramas have made their way up there as well? Yeah, so His Dark Materials is made in Wales. So every, it's sort of, I imagine it's, it is sort of, because, you know, it was all very much London central, and now it seems yeah. to be London, Manchester, and a lot of it in Wales. The drama, the drama is, a lot of the drama is made in South Wales because they, well, A, they've got these massive studios now down in the Bay, but there's also all of the, the supply chains are also down there. So the people who make the sets, the people who rent out the facilities, you know, that the catering and the trailers that you need for actors on sets, a lot of those companies are also based in South Wales. So um, it's, it's a real, real booming industry down there. It's really exciting. Yeah, I was lucky enough a few years ago to be able to go to the studios and go on a little tour around. And they are right. great. It's, it's huge, it is, isn't it? It's just on the side of the bay, just a big blue sort of building. That's right. It's like, but it's like a village inside. It is, yeah. All these like little pathways and people... I always feel like what a TV studio, there's sort of a buzz to it that you can't really... I imagine you, get, you can get sort of an equivalent to it working in theatre as well, but there's something about everyone being so unite to make something creative that's sort of quite special really definitely you get that a lot in theater as well um it's and you know i suppose um in theater you know you're at the place where it's you're making something that's going to be performed over and over again whereas in tv you're, you're filming something that's going to be shot once you know and then um and then you know uh, but in the can for posterity is there anything that you've worked on on TV or seen on TV that you thought would translate quite well onto stage? Oh, that's a good question. Um, oh, well, I tell you, I, 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 there, there, there are examples that I th- what comes to mind is something that I've worked on already. So, the, when I worked at the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield, because I was the artistic director there for seven years, um, I was shown this documentary of. Um, this about this guy who wanted to go to his prom at school in a dress and he's he's called Jamie and we did eventually commission that into a musical which is now you know well is meant to be on the West End called Everybody's Talking About Jamie and and that was an instance where you're sort of looking at at a documentary actually and thinking oh this is a stage show and more than that this is a musical it sort of just lends itself you could just say where the songs were. You could just tell the story was universal in a way that was going to talk to a lot of people. And um, and, and I suppose be enhanced by what theatre could bring to it. Yeah. Is that something that's going to... Is, will that be coming back then, hopefully, when we've sort of got the all clear to head back to theatres? I'm sure it will, because it's meant to be going on a massive UK tour as well. It's probably coming to Hull at some point. Um, well, you briefly mentioned it there, working in Sheffield. It often seems like, like you said, in Hull and Sheffield, these sort of northern towns, they maybe don't get... It's sort of, they seem very distant from the actual creative world to head to the BBC, to head to ITV, these sort of, you know, the big names in media. Why do you think that... Do you feel there is a sort of divide there between north and south? Well, I suppose not when Manchester's in question, because of course Manchester, the media city, you know, the news moved to Manchester, didn't That's it? True. And Breakfast TV moved to Manchester, and I think Coronation Street and Granada Studios and all of that sort of boom happened in Manchester. One of the things that I might say is that in the north, it feels a bit like there's an east west divide where Manchester gets a lot of attention, and Sheffield and Leeds, perhaps, you know, and Hull, Scarborough, you know, get get less attention and you sort of you want to make sure that um you know as the the north south divide maybe you know what the government is laughingly calling leveling up you want to make sure that actually it spreads along the east and west as well up there um because otherwise what's in what's going to happen is the manchester's in danger of becoming a sort of super city 
and, and and Sheffield and the surrounding areas would become sort of suburbs. And that's a, that would be a terrible thing because, um, you know, Sheffield is an amazing place in its, in its own right. Mm. We headed up to Manchester. We went and had a look around the um, Media City or the big TV studios and everything they've got going on around there. And it's amazing. Every it's just it is yeah. like just a town for TV and it is bring no. It's just going to say it's great because it's bringing all of that work and creativity to Manchester. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Which, well, so I'm not knocking that. I'm just making you know just want to make sure that um, it's being shared. And there you have it. That was my interview with two-time Olivier Award winner Daniel Evans. Big thank you to Daniel for coming on the show. I really, really appreciate it. Hope you like this kind of chilled out type of chat that we're going for. I've got some more interviews on the way. We've got some that out already. Go and listen to the podcast, subscribe, do all that stuff. Make sure you go and look up um, Daniel's show about Jamie. That's going to be really interesting. If it does come to Hull or near Hull, you can definitely count on me and Harry going to see that. <laughs>